So now that we've designed the D-latch and the D-flip-flop, let's go back to that microprocessor circuit that I'd shown you before. And, you know, let's kind of put this latch or this flip-flop into place and let's make sure that we understand what role it plays. So, you know, you can view this as a latch or you can view it as a flip-flop for now. But you'll essentially see that, you know, two different combinational circuits are being separated by one of these flip-flops. And what that allows me to do is to have some inputs coming in, right? We had gone through the example where the inputs were the numbers 5 and 7. And I wanted this latch or this flip-flop to have the behavior where at the rising clock edge, I was going to capture whatever came in at my inputs. So I capture the values 5 and 7. And then those captured values don't change for the next entire clock cycle, right? So this combinational circuit sees a very stable set of inputs 5 and 7, does whatever it needs to do. So maybe it's doing an add and producing the result 12. Okay, and at the next clock, rising clock edge, the next flip-flop is going to see its inputs 12. At that instantaneous moment right here, it's going to capture the result as 12. And that result is not going to change for the next entire clock cycle, right? So if I examine the value of this, of this latch for that next entire cycle, I'm going to see the value 12. And that feeds as a stable input to the next combinational circuit for that next entire clock duration. Okay, so even during the cycle, the inputs over here might be changing from 12 to something else, right? If I'm adding a different set of numbers, these bits might be gradually transitioning from 12 to the new result 17. But that doesn't change the output value over here because this latch is in a remember state where it is only remembering whatever it saw at the last rising clock edge, right? So its inputs can change, but the value captured within the latch only changes at the next rising clock edge, right? And that's why even though the previous circuit is producing the new number 17, this circuit sees the input 12 for an entire clock cycle and does its math based on that, right? So that's the reason that we had these latches and these flip-flops. They basically create a way to decouple different circuits and make sure that the value produced in one stage moves on to the next stage only at the next rising clock edge. Now, in this discussion that I just had, I was kind of interchangeably using the words latch and the flip-flop, but I was really meaning a flip-flop, right? Because I was saying that a value gets captured at the rising clock edge, and that really describes a flip-flop, right? So why did I say that even a latch may be okay, right? So let me just kind of go through that example of what happens if I used a latch instead of a flip-flop. And you'll see that in many cases, even a latch circuit would work just fine. So let me show you why that is the case. So let's assume that this is an adder circuit. And let's say that this is indeed a latch. That means it's going to record its inputs anytime the clock is high. So let's assume that the clock goes up, stays high, and goes down. And during the cycle, let's say that my inputs were 5 and 7, and I produce a result 12. And now when the clock goes high, this next latch is going to record its inputs, right? So it sees an input of 12, and it records the value 12. Okay, and then later the clock goes down and stays down and so on. Now during this entire phase over here, this latch is going to keep looking at its inputs and every time the input changes, the output is going to change as well. Because it's a latch, during the entire high clock phase, my output is going to mirror whatever comes in at my input. Okay, so let's see if that's okay. So what I want to prevent is the inputs of this combinational circuit changing during the entire clock cycle. Right, so I want to make sure that the input 12 is stable for an entire clock cycle and Keep in mind that during this cycle, the previous adder has already moved on to a new set of inputs, right? So maybe its inputs now are 8 and 9, which means that the output is going to be in the state where it is transitioning from a 12 to a 17. And the real question is, at what point do the bits start transitioning from a 12 to a 17? If that transition happens early, maybe at this time over here, if it happens at that time, then the inputs to the latch are starting to change and the clock is high, which means that what gets recorded by the latch is not 12, but some kind of transitionary state from 12 to 17, right? So the latch would just not work in that case, right? If the previous stage circuit is so fast that its output start changing within a half cycle, then I'm in trouble. But if the output values start changing from 12 to 17 at this point over here, right? That is, if, if you're well beyond the half cycle, then you're okay because the outputs are going to start changing here. 
but the clock is in a low state, that means the latch is no longer recording its inputs, right? It's basically remembering whatever it had last seen. So in that case, the output of the latch is going to stay at a 12. Okay, so a latch can also work as long as its input values don't change until the clock has become low. Okay, but for the most part, the functionality that we're trying to implement is that of a flip-flop where we're trying to record values at the start of a cycle and trying to retain that for an entire cycle. So now that we've seen this basic memory element, this latch unit, which records a value and then retains it and remembers it for an entire cycle, we can now design what is referred to as a sequential circuit. So a sequential circuit, you know, has a little bit of combinational circuitry in it. So there are logic gates over here where the output simply reflects whatever input you are giving to it. In addition to that now, I have the state element which can remember what has happened in previous cycles, right? So based on whatever happened in the past, it moves to a certain state and it remembers that. And that feeds as one of the inputs to my combinational circuit, right? And so essentially whatever output I produce is not just a function of the inputs, it's also a function of the state, that is whatever happened in previous cycles. And once I create an output, I can also perhaps create a separate next state value which loops back and gets recorded in this memory element that is referred to as state. I have a clock and having this clock make sure that this is not a wild feedback loop where you produce a result, goes back, changes the value of state that feeds in over here again, produces a new result and so on. So by having a clock I'm making sure that the new value of state gets recorded perhaps at every rising clock edge and then the inputs to the combinational circuit are stable for the next entire cycle. So it does whatever it needs to do, produces a new set of outputs, those loop back and get recorded at the next rising clock edge, and then in the next cycle you perhaps do a different computation. Okay, so maybe this will be made most clear with a few examples. So we've essentially designed what is referred to as a finite state machine, where the machine has a current state, that's the memory element, this is perhaps my flip-flop, and so at every rising clock edge, I record my new state. That then feeds as input to a couple of combinational circuits. One of them produces an output result. The other combinational circuit produces what new state I should be moving into. That feeds back over here and gets recorded at the next clock edge. Right? So both of these combinational circuits, as inputs, they receive whatever inputs is coming from an external agent, as well as what my current state value is.